Joining us now here in the studio to talk about all things Queen's Park as we check in at affairs at the Ontario Legislature, here are two friends of ours. Syria Grell, who is the former Deputy Director of Communications to Premier Kathleen Wynne as of, I guess, just a few days ago. You just left. She's now moved on to the communications consulting firm called Pilot PMR. And John McEtitian, who's the president of the Bradgate Research Group and a former advisor back in the day to Premier Mike Harris. Welcome both of you here to TVO. I want to start with this letter that Andrea Horvath wrote to Premier Kathleen Wynne saying that if your upcoming budget has anything resembling a tax increase, a fee increase, a revenue tool increase to pay for transit, we can't support that, meaning we New Democrats. Um, you're not in the Premier's office anymore, but I think you can probably imagine how she reacted when she got the letter. So tell us, how did she react? I would imagine she probably wished that, that Ms. Horvath had, had written about how she intends to pay for transit if we're not going to do anything like that. Um, I think it's a real shame that we reduce this issue, which is hugely important to this region and to all of Ontario. We reduce it to taxes and tolls, and, and we act like um, there's some other way. Do you think it was a useful thing to write that letter? I think it was a great thing. I think it was uh, probably the best letter she's ever written. Why? Uh, because she's clearly getting her message out before the letter, and now she's reinforcing it. Um, the, the shocking thing is, if you were to uh, to uh, give the quotes and the contents without uh, the signature, uh, you'd have a lot of people thinking it was their leader who are members of other political parties. I think she's clearly established herself as the centrist party, and uh, the Liberals are working overtime to try to be the most left-wing party we've ever had in Ontario. You want to come back at that? Well, I, I think it's a shame when we talk about these things from, from extremes, right? These things shouldn't be extremes. And one of the things that I think people are responding to, both with Horvath and, and with uh, Premier Wynne, is that we're talking about real issues, right? We're making decisions about the kind of problems we want and the kind of communities we want. And it shouldn't be ideological. It should be practical. How are we going to invest in these things, right? And it can't be, you can't just come at it from from the same old sort of tired ideas of I'm on the left so I can't do this and I'm on the right. We have to find new ways to pay for these things that are hugely important to our society and to our economy. I know you're not a transit expert, but on the face of it, does it sound possible to invest multiple billions of dollars in new urban transit without figuring out new, as they call them, revenue streams to pay for it? Sure. Um, New ways. You need to write the premier letter then. No, no, no. It, it's, it's, it, I mean, this government has clearly established billions of billions of dollars of waste, incompetence, bad spending, mismanagement. Get off the fence. Tell me what you're uh, Hang on. <laughs> Buying votes. Uh, if they would have taken all of that money, I mean, I heard about a tragedy that happened in a Toronto shelter this week, and you know, part of the issue was, well, many issues with that story, but one of them was they don't get single rooms; they have to share a room, and it's like, well, they could have single rooms if we weren't wasting money on wait, on canceled gas plants, for example. Okay, but that money's out the door, so the yep. question remains, can I, you... I have, I have full confidence that if the Liberal government is re-elected, that the uh, McGinty win legacy will be more <laughs> brand new billions of wasted dollars. McGinty win legacy. Yeah. This is, that is, as, you're doing what they did last time, which was the Harris <laughs> Eves thing. Well, um, you learn but from I, people <laughs> where it's successful. I don't know. No, but I, I mean, it's the. Uh, oh, I only say that because this week it was reported that she, you know, the premier, is trying to distance herself from the past and from you know, well, I wasn't part of that government. It's like, well, nothing could be more fallacious, right? Like you can't but be I a cabinet minister, you can't be a campaign co-chair, you can't be. And I know the limitations in those jobs. Trust me, but you can't do that and then be the premier for a year and say I had nothing to do with the history okay. of the party. Siri? But did you feel that way when Ernie Eves did that? Absolutely. Yeah. Part I, of why I, I wasn't think, as part of his campaign. I think, he is, I think he is absolutely right in one thing, right? The, the challenge that she faces right now, and this is absolutely true, is proving that she's different, yeah. right? I mm -hmm. absolutely agree with that. That's mm -hmm. a totally fair point. Um, she's come in after essentially three terms in government, asking for another one. Very few governments anywhere win four mandates. It's a very difficult position. And you're right, she's inherited a, an atmosphere of distrust, and she absolutely has to overcome that. And her job now is to prove that she is different and you, to differentiate herself. Do you think herself. if she has the time that she'd be able to prove that? I think she does, yeah. You think she, I, would, I think be, she, she would be able to? I think she would be able to. Have you ever met her? No. Well, yeah. yes, I have, sorry, yeah. so socially. Yeah. She really is. You know, when I, I left recently and I, I tweeted a, a link to a West Wing uh, moment, 
which I always think about when I think about her, and it's when Josh and Sam are talking about, like, if you ever find the real deal. She is the real deal. She is smart. Um, she cares so much about these things, and I think she has a really clear idea of what she wants to do. Whether she'll have time to do it, I don't know, well, but no, I do think she could. I do think and she the reason could. I asked you that question was because if she's the real deal yeah. and if she's that smart, mm -hmm. then she will avoid a spring election at all costs. Because she needs more time. She needs more time. Yeah, and it's a hard position, right? You're, you're absolutely right. She needs time to establish it, but the longer she does that, the more she feeds into the opposition. And it's a well, tough position. Or she, you know, given that she's the one that controls all the cards, I don't know that that's, you know, I think that you're taking away a lot of power from the, the conservatives and the NDP. They, they get to decide, right? They have a role in this, too. It's a minority government. They all decide together. Um, so I don't think it's all about her. And I think well, the, one of the shame, one of the things that's unfortunate about the conservatives, and it'll be interesting to see if, if Tim writes back as well um, with some ideas, is that, you know, from the second she got in there, they've decided we're not going to participate in this minority government. We're going to wait for an election. And I think they're missing a real opportunity to be a part of these conversations, right, and, say, and I, I, to I, offer up some ideas. I'm not sure they're, they're all equal down there in as much as it seems that the election will be decided by Andrea Horvath, mm -hmm. as it has been for the last two budgets. If she supports the budget, there's no election. If she doesn't, there is. She kind of holds all the power, doesn't she? Yeah, I, I, and I'm going to say, to be fair to Tim, I mean, I, I'm not sure whether he got bad advice or he made bad decisions in simply saying no, 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 the two previous budgets. Um, which he is saying again. Uh, yes, but this time he at least is saying something else, uh, which is that he's got a bill out there. He's talking about job creation. He's saying that's the most important thing for Ontario. This is the Million and, Jobs and Act. The Million yeah. Jobs Act. And, and thankfully, there's something other than no to talk about. So Do you think I, he damaged I think, himself the last time by not participating? I, I think it was a mistake. I yeah. think he hurt himself, and I think he's learned from his mistakes, and he's now going out there with a positive message and saying, hey, if I was the government, if you let me be premier, I've got a plan, and I believe I know what's important for Ontario, which is jobs. Uh, the premier saying, I know what's important for Ontario, and that's more taxes. And the NDP saying, hey, how are you? You guys all like me, so I'm not going to say anything else. Yeah. <laughs> Let's pick up on that. Uh, I have read several comments from several true, I was going to say true blue New Democrats, but that's not possible, right, true orange or whatever, from lifelong New Democrats who are extremely disappointed with the fact that the NDP leader has said nothing about many of the leading issues that we're debating in the province these days. And in fact, on Tuesday, um, the day after Family Day, uh, Andrea Horvath had a news conference in which she was asked, what do you think of the new changes to the minimum wage policy? She declined to give an answer. What do you think about the Liberals' attempts to beef up pensions? She declined to give an answer. Um, what do you think of the advisability of her not saying anything about anything, but watching her poll numbers continue to rise as that happens? I think it's a really sad statement on on the you know on our society and our democracy that the party that does the best is the party with no opinions you know whether we disagree with each other i want someone who puts out their plan and said this is what i want to do and this is what i believe in that's what we should expect from our leaders that's what we should demand and i do think it's it's unfortunate that she's doing so well by basically having no ideas no plan and no opinions john uh of two minds one as a uh, a partisan as an activist as someone who wants a better Ontario um, I, I don't like it so that's my personal opinion my professional opinion is she's doing brilliant yeah, keep doing uh, it. she knows her audience yeah. uh, the other every time the other two leaders say anything uh, they get in trouble so clearly the right thing to do is to do what she's doing and it's the reason why not only is she the most popular leader but she and her number and her party's numbers have done better and better and better yeah, so how why, why would you do something different. At some point, do you have to actually say what you think? Yeah, you become premier, and then you say, oh, I was wrong about everything that I said in the campaign, <laughs> and then you change your mind. But seriously, do you know, I mean, we're not into an, we're not technically into an election campaign yet, although I think we probably are, yeah. uh, figuratively speaking. But at some point, at what point, do you have to actually say, here's what I'm going to do, and here's how I'll pay for it? Again, two minds. Uh, one would be the traditional, which is the throne speech. Right, so literally most governments, as in no, no, almost, but she's not in yet. That's what I'm saying. Almost all successful uh, victors in electoral contests get elected and have a throne speech that does not resemble their campaign platform. Uh, Mike Harris, going back, is one of the rare exceptions. Uh, Stephen Harper, again, someone who's almost on the verge of getting 100% of his last platform 
implemented. If you look at the liberals, they've had three opportunities uh, in general elections to campaign and then get elected and almost uh, none of their campaign platforms that for many of the three elections having were actually, substantially Having actually passed. written a throne speech, okay. I would disagree with that. I would you, say her, you've, you've written them? Yeah, I wrote her, her last one with the team, obviously, but I would say it, it pretty strongly resembled what she stands for, which is making, you know, making smart investments in infrastructure. That was one part of the uh, throne speech in communities and in, in responsible government. And everything that she laid out in that plan is what she continues to be about today. Okay. So Siri, just, we're, you know, not everybody follows the minutia of Queen's Park and is able to understand uh, all of the you know, arcane legislative traditions that now have to be followed as there is a, what appears to be a countdown to a budget and potentially right. an election. It takes two weeks to put up a pride flag. So, <laughs> <laughs> mind you, they did it very quickly. Oh, was that quick? Well. They well, had she was a, talking about using official channels. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I see you're, you're referring to the pride flag at Queen's Park, yeah. which they had a vote, a unanimous vote, which took 10 seconds right, to after, put up. Right, after about a week and a half. After no, a week and a half. It's great that. that it's up. But anyway, <laughs> that's not what I was going to refer, refer to. What I was going to ask was, Andrew Horvath has said, if there are any increases in fees, taxes, tolls, etc., we can't support the budget. The Premier has pretty clearly said, there will be increases in fees, taxes, tolls, whatever. There will be a, a revenue stream dedicated to paying for transit in the budget. These are two irreconcilable positions. So from where you sit, is it a slam dunk that, that we're at the polls in the spring? Um, well, I would say yes, if there wasn't a history of Horvath changing her mind. Meaning what? I'm, well, I think she's, she's said, I, I won't support it, and then she kind of makes concessions, and she sees where, what the lay of the land is. And so, yeah, if she sticks to her word, absolutely, I would say that's the, the case. I would say that um, the Premier's been pretty clear about what she needs to do and how she um, wants to go forward. And so, yeah, unless Ms. Horvath decides that um, to back down, then, yeah, I would say so. Because you, you're convinced the, the government will not back down. Well, you know what, I, you, you wrote about this this morning in one of your columns, and you were saying that, you know, it's going to be a decision about whether the premier, you know, feels like she's on good footing or wants to call Horvath's bluff. I think the other alternative is that maybe she just really believes that we need to invest in transit, you well, know? And I think we should talk a little bit about asking our governments, whoever's in power, to make the right decision and to tell the truth and to do the best thing we can. And, and one of the things that I find really unfortunate about this minority government, although it's a reality of our system, is that parties have to be constantly in campaign mode even when they're in governing mode, right? Mm -hmm. And so the opposition too, you always have to be weighing how will this look at the polls versus what's the best decision right now. And, and I think that I hope uh, that when we look at this issue of investing in infrastructure all across the province, we think about it in terms of what the issue actually is, and it's, it's an investment that we desperately need to make. Well, fair enough, but, but I think the first interview she did after she became premier, she was sitting in that chair, mm -hmm. and I said, how long do you want to govern for before you go to the polls? And she said, all the way through. Yeah. It'd be my hope to be able to go all the way to 2015. Right. So does she not have to put some water in her wine to make it to 2015? Right, and I think you, you decide where you want to put that water, right? Which glasses? And um, whether she does that with transit remains to be seen. John, what do you think as you look at the, the two, what appear to be irreconcilable positions right now? I, I can see where the, the media loves the brinkmanship of an election any minute because then people keep on tuning in and buying newspapers, but... Um, You're not sure? Everybody's forgetting what happened last time, right? Like I sat there watching it and I like to think I know all the angles and I certainly look for new ones maybe more than the average person and she did something totally unexpected. You know, the NDP leader sat in her chair. And it was like, no one, no smart person saw that call coming, right? It was, you're going to stand with the government or you're going to stand with the opposition. And instead, the NDP just Ab sat on their hands. Abstained. And the budget was passed. So the question is, no one's actually in this current debate asked her those questions. Not that she's answering any questions. She's, she, yeah. she but she could be firmly against this budget and sit on her hands again. But the difference is, I think, this year is that she's done well in the by-elections, right? She's got to be feeling good. They've won, is it four of seven? Somebody uh, in the room? Okay. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Well, four of nine. Uh, or four of seven, sorry. Yeah. Anyway, she's done, she's, she's done well in Niagara the by-elections. Kitchener-Waterloo. Right. Windsor. Windsor West? Is that the one it was? <laughs> this is, is embarrassing. We should just yeah, stop. Yeah, I know. We should know this off the top of our head. Uh, okay, but... But she's done well. And yet not. 
So when you look at the last two, right, take the last two by-elections, right, big victory again in Niagara Falls, and you go, and that massive breakthrough in the liberal heartland of Toronto, they did absolutely nothing, complete and total stall. So the NDP have a massive ability to win at least one solid but they were seat smart. They concentrated their efforts, right? They know. That. I think the interesting thing that well, I smart. find about their party is that on the local level, they're choosing good candidates. They're organizing well. They're really connecting to what people want. They're giving tangible, we will do this for you in this community. And then on the, the big picture, nothing. But right? if you thought that she's, because uh, certainly all reports are her, uh, her caucus are all hawks now and they want to go, you would think that they would be able to figure out that if you're going to face 100 plus seats, in a couple of weeks that maybe the smart thing to do is prove to everybody that you can win two. Yeah. And they didn't. They but, didn't play. But you ask what's ride. different this time. Last year when the NDP sat on their hands and abstained and did not, didn't vote against the budget, didn't vote in favor of it, they were eight points lower in the polls than where they are today. Mm -hmm. They are feeling, you would have to think, Boyd, B-U-O-Y-E-D, about their position right now. So that's a big difference yeah. uh, from a year ago, right? It's better than they were and meaningless to where they need to end up. Because as we all know, you can have massive swings at least once during a campaign, if not more. So the only thing that you know for sure when you force an election is that you've got an election. And, and the difference being when you're in a general election, too, people are going to look more at the leadership, right? Yeah. They're not going to look as much as at the local candidate. They're going to look at the leadership and say, what do you stand for, right? And I don't know if that's going to benefit them. So would you anticipate, one of these columns I did in the past suggested that there are two, and maybe you could confirm this for it. My thing was a complete speculation thing that you got they the... All? <laughs> no, they're not all. <laughs> but it was a spec piece saying you've got the hawks on one side of the premier saying, your numbers are pretty good. You've put the gas plants behind you. You're never going to be more popular. Let's go, go, go. And you've got the dubs saying, well, hold on a sec, hurry up. You know, you can't take that support to the bank. Uh, one little mini scandal, we could be deep in the soup all over again. Let's see if we can govern a little longer. Where do you think the premier is on that? Well, I think, I don't think, I think you're wrong in that it's not two camps. I think the thing about people is that we contain multitudes, right? And so at any given moment, you feel good about some things and, and bad about others. And, and they're all playing this game, right? They're all saying, okay, how, how much longer can I go until it starts to look bad on me, right? And Tim's thinking about that, and Andrea's thinking about that, and, and the Premier's thinking about that as well. They're weighing a lot of things. And... Um, yeah, I, th I think that, as you said, I think that the course on that has almost run itself out. If you were advising Premier Wynn and you were one of those people in the you room... You guys would get along really well, I think. I bet you would. <laughs> would, you be, would you be saying to her, it's never going to be better than now, go now? Or would you be saying, hold off, stick around as long as you can? I'd be telling her, if you believe in yourself as much as some of your former staff and supporters of, that you are the real deal that the more time you have, the better it is for you accomplishing things and being seen as the real deal, to wait. So you don't worry that things get worse the longer you wait? Not if you have belief in yourself. Yeah, but Ernie Eves yeah. always said the biggest mistake he made was waiting too long. He should have gone right away. What did I just say? <laughs> oh, oh, zing, zing. Ouch. Sorry. <laughs> All right. But I, I like that point because I think that that I think that is part of the thing is that she does have a plan. She does know what she wants to do, and I, I think she can turn people around either way, right? Hopefully, if she stays in, I think she could really you know make people see that that she's see, a different uh, person. Yeah, and I actually think that um, if she goes this spring because she's thrown down a gauntlet, that she's listened to somebody in the inside that's varying from that. That that her uh, from what I've read, and you know firsthand, but that her gut is to go the distance, to work as a minority, not to make the Joe Clark mistake of we're going to govern with a minority like we have a majority, mm -hmm. but to actually say, I have to make accommodations. Because yeah. certainly we haven't seen the budget yet. So she can certainly go out there and say, look, this is what I want to do. This is how far I'd like to go. I've been clear about it, but I don't believe I can get the votes mm -hmm. through. Yeah. So you know what? I'm telling you now, I want these things, and this will be page one of my election platform. Yeah. But as a realist, it won't pass this house. She's got lots of time to do that. Siri, do you think we will see a budget? Yeah. There will be a budget introduced. Yeah. And presumably debated and then voted on. What's the alternative? Well, that's what I'm wondering. I mean, yeah. if, if according to the rules... Not reading are you? No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> but if I understand the rules properly, if the three House leaders decide mm -hmm. that something short of a budget is a confidence vote, they can make it so. Mm -hmm. And so there could be a bill that comes before the legislature short of a budget, 
where the three leaders decide, you know what, we're going to have an election anyway, let's just go. They decide to make it a confidence vote and off to the race as we go. Is that possible? It's a possibility, and, and honestly, I, I wasn't involved in, in those conversations. But yeah, I'm sure people, you know, look at all the different options that are before them. They could do it. I would like it to be on something, you know, if we're going to throw down, let's throw down. Let's throw down over the big yeah, issues. Yeah, that, that's, that's a little arcane. Yeah. I mean, that, that might be a did Steve, warn you. Steve <laughs> Paik specialty, but I'm just yeah. saying that I, I think if, um, from a government's perspective, if you don't want to be defeated in the House, if you don't want to... Uh, have it go that way, then you come out and announce the budget, you have the debates, and before the vote, you say, we're going to go to the polls. And I think the other thing we're risking with all of this, too, is about the level of cynicism amongst the general population, right? And the more you game the system, the more you manipulate right. when these things are going to go, the more people are going to say, you know what, I don't care about any of you. But that's so our I system. think you have to be... That's yeah. our system. We're in a minority parliament. And I think parliament. we have and to use it, it. We have to use it wisely, right? And every time you prorogue or you do something like that, you alienate some people, and I think they have to really watch out about that. If you're the government, is it better to go into an election having lost, for example, a vote on the budget, or because you just decided one day you want to go to the lieutenant governor and look like you're proactively calling the election? I don't think it, uh, a loss is ever a good thing on your side to start anything else. I mean, you'd rather just be a winner, winner, winner. Although Stephen Harper won his majority government after having been defeated in the House. Mm -hmm. So maybe it doesn't matter? It, it always matters. It's a question of how much. Hmm. And that's where, like, the, to me, the, the bigger issue right now would be around the cynicism, right? Like, hmm. the Premier's portraying herself as new and different, and I was there, but I wasn't part of it, and all that stuff. It's like, the more you play the same games, the exactly. same, run the same way, do the same things, and it's harder for people to buy the myth. Do you know right now... They, what they're thinking in they terms... They took my BlackBerry away, so no, I don't. <laughs> but in terms of whether they, they, they fear losing a budget vote and going to the polls for who's, that reason? Who's they? Well, that, that, you know, the they <laughs> is the collective wisdom around the Premier. Um, what was the question? Sorry, did you... <laughs> whether they fear losing a budget vote and going to the polls that way as opposed to taking the bull like by I the Like I said, I'm sure they're themselves. looking at all the scenarios, right? I think they, they fear... You want to know what they fear? They fear... Um, living in a province where we're not talking about important issues, where we're cutting everything away, where we decide that cutting taxes and shrinking government is the ultimate goal. I think they fear that. Um, and they fear that a woman who really is, and I'm not a partisan person, but I do really believe in her. I think they fear that a woman who is really different from her predecessors, who really is a smart, caring person, is not going to get the chance that she deserves to run this province. Let's been, finish up on there. this. Yeah. Been, been there, he said. Been there. Yeah, Let's finish up on this. Uh, the polls are basically one third, one third, one third right now. I mean, it's very competitive. Pollsters it's very tight. Pollsters are always right. They're only real pollsters. Not <laughs> only real. Pollsters. Okay, John, you're a real pollster. Yes. Yeah, what are the numbers right now? Uh, I, if I had any, I couldn't share it with you. Paid for them, am sure. I am I wrong in saying it's about a third, a third, no, a third? I, I think that's within the margin. Within of the error margin of error. Sure. Does anybody have momentum right now? No. So what does that mean? It's a weird thing, isn't it? Um, I, I like the way you're, make, you're not your latest uh, column, but the one before, right? Like, that's the other problem with going now, right? Like, an election is not about just having a vote. It's about moving forward. It's about another outcome. So uh, the story that nobody's talked about in the sense of what happens election night if we get the same results, uh, I think we're looking at two of the three leaders being replaced. Either that they'll fall on their swords or their parties will say uh, goodbye to them. Uh, no one's talking about that yet because the optimists in all parties and the loyalists are smart enough to shut up. Mm -hmm. um, but this is do or die for two of the three leaders. The only one that's not true for is Andrea. So She can lose and stick around. She can lose and stick around, absolutely. And, and however she does, she's going to do better than they did. So the only question is how far can she take it? And the bizarreness of a three-way split like that, right? I mean, if she's... They've won three of the last four by-elections in Ontario. If I'm a Conservative incumbent, I, I'm not all warm and fuzzy over that. Um, in Toronto, they haven't been able to make a breakthrough at all. So if I'm a Liberal incumbent, I'm not feeling too bad about that. But we could have a province that's split into three pieces. And if you thought this minority government sucked from, from trying to run a government, Get ready for the next one. 
which could be, if it ends up in a minority, it'll be a much more three-part minority yeah. with two parties dealing with leadership situations, mm. which will mean what? We're probably two years, uh, maybe three, in an ugly minority before we get new leaders in place. Nobody wants that. Siri, last word to you on this. So vote for a majority for the Liberals. <laughs> Everything will be fine. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm sure that'll do it. Okay. <laughs> John McEtition, Siri Agrell, good of you to come in tonight. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much. Pleasure. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.